see your face. In 1967, Jimmy Hoffa began serving a 13-year prison sentence. It was the beginning of the end for the man who was called America's most powerful labor leader. Hoffa was pardoned four years later, but his troubles were far from over. On July 30th, 1975, he left home and disappeared without a trace. Was Jimmy Hoffa kidnapped or murdered? If so, why and by whom? Did he flee to a distant country? Why did Jimmy Hoffa disappear? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Be firm, but return to work and wait for the government of the United States to be able to make the decision. Don't take the law in your own hands or you're going to hurt me. Don't do it, please. As president of the Teamsters Union, Jimmy Hoffa commanded a workforce larger than the United States Army. Hoffa was a leader gifted with great charisma, one of America's working class heroes. One day in 1975, Hoffa went to a meeting at a suburban Detroit restaurant. He has not been seen since. My father, James R. Hoffa, has been missing for some 32 hours. He left for an appointment at Max's Red Fox restaurant at approximately 1.30 p.m. Wednesday, July 30, 1975. He called home at approximately 2.15 p.m. We have not heard from him since. Down in this lot here. Acting on anonymous tips, local authorities searched the Detroit suburbs for a body. Jimmy Hoffa is still missing. He was a powerful man, president of the world's largest labor union. But powerful men make enemies. Who might have wanted Hoffa out of the way, and why? Is it conceivable that he was kidnapped for ransom, or that he deliberately dropped out of sight? The answer to the mystery of Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance might be found by tracing his spectacular rise to power. <laughs> Violence was commonplace in the working world Jimmy Hoffa entered during the late 1920s. Police and strike breakers battled fiercely with union workers as the labor movement gained momentum. In his teens, Hoffa joined a small Detroit local in the Teamsters Union of Truckers and Warehousemen. As a fearless young organizer, he helped engineer dozens of strikes to improve working conditions. Truckers began hauling more and more of the nation's freight as our highway system expanded. The Teamsters grew into a powerful union. Hoffa moved quickly up the union executive ladder. By the age of 33, he headed Local 299 in Detroit. Eleven years later, in 1957, Hoffa ran for international president of the Teamsters. He gained support in locals all over the country by brilliant politicking. When the delegates were polled, Hoffa triumphed by a three-to-one margin. Pete Camerata is co-chairman of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Well, when Hoffa spoke to the rank and file, he was always able to reach them. And even though Jimmy Hoffa was a little man, he had a certain amount of charisma about him. 
when you shook hands with Jimmy Hoffa, even though Hoffa was a little fella, five foot five or something like that, you thought you were shaking hands with somebody much bigger. Hoffa was willing to get right down in the street with the brothers and win what they had to win. And that's what people loved him for. In 1967, the master freight agreement gave Hoffa more power than any union leader before him. Now, truckers nationwide would be bound by the same contract. To many businessmen and politicians, this was a frightening prospect. What scared them is the fact that Jimmy Hoffa could, could say uh, to uh, 400,000 Teamsters or 450,000 Teamsters at the time to park the trucks and they'd park them. If Teamster truckers carried most of America's food, fuel, and clothing for the marketplace, is it possible that Jimmy Hoffa had too much power? Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Clark Mullenhoff. Jimmy Hoffa had more uncontrolled power than any other person in the United States, including the president. He was not accountable to anyone. Uh, he controlled employers, he controlled politicians through his uh, gifts of union funds and cash or through his use of anti-labor charges against the political figures. He controlled everything that moved on a truck. Hoffa never used his power to shut down the nation's commerce. Publicly, he played the part of a labor statesman. We're asking for language dealing with safety of equipment. We're asking for wage increases. People who knew Hoffa said that privately, he was a hot-tempered and ruthless man. Well, from the, the first time I met Jimmy Hoffa throughout his uh, whole life, he was a, a totally confident, cocky, banner rooster type of individual. Uh, he could be most ingratiating and pleasant, even boyish. Pays to have friends. <laughs> but he could turn around and snap his fingers and become a tyrant if he were crossed in any respect. To the rank and file, Hoffa was a powerful boss who won good contracts. Enemies, however, claimed he made deals with employers outside Detroit, allowing them to pay his Teamsters a substandard wage. Hoffa centralized Teamster power and took control of the huge Central States Pension Fund. He lent millions to build gambling casinos. An estimated $170 million of Teamster Pension Funds went into Las Vegas. There are also charges that Hoffa had ties to organized crime. From at least the mid-1940s, Jimmy Hoffa was dealing with organized crime figures in all parts of the country. He was using them to uh, enforce his dictates on local labor leaders uh, who were honest. He was also using them uh, as a network uh, for his own advancement and his own power. He put them in power in various unions from one end of the country to the other. The best answer in regards to hoodlums and what have you is the fact that every strike we have uh, with employers who really want to fight they revert to hiring hoodlums. And unless we know who our enemy is, unless we're in a position to do something about it, you'll lose your strike. But who controlled whom? What was the real relationship between Hoffa and men like New Jersey's Tony Provenzano? You've got people in Detroit, at least 15 who have police records. You've got Joey Glimco in Chicago. I say you're not tough enough to get rid of these people then. Well. I don't propose to You haven't moved tough. against any of them. I don't propose to act tough. I will follow the Constitution of the International Union. I don't frighten too easy. Well, you're not, you're and not I don't tough. And I don't intend to have the impression left, as been stated publicly, that I'm controlled by gangsters. I am not controlled by them. Mr. Hoffa, I'm certainly... From 1957 to 1963, attorney Robert Kennedy and his brother, Senator John Kennedy, feuded bitterly with Hoffa, as the McClellan Committee probed labor crimes. When John Kennedy was elected president in 1960, he appointed his younger brother attorney general. Bobby declared all-out war on organized crime. Hoffa was indicted for extortion, perjury, 
wiretapping, jury tampering, and pension fund embezzlement. Somehow, he managed to avoid conviction. Hoffa's bag of tricks included efforts to buy off sheriffs, prosecutors, congressmen, senators, governors, and he tried to influence cabinet officers and he at least compromised them. He even tried to buy me off and he came out just out of the blue sky and said, every man has his price, Clark, what's yours? After seven years of prosecution, Hoffa was convicted of jury tampering through the testimony of a disgruntled teamster. Later, he was found guilty of embezzlement. In 1967, Hoffa surrendered to authorities to serve his term. The fateful series of events that would lead to Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance had begun. In 1967, ex-teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa headed for Lewisburg Penitentiary to serve his term. He may have regretted the involvement with gangsters that had led to his downfall. But Hoffa's knowledge of the underworld would become an even greater burden in prison. For nearly four years, Jimmy Hoffa brooded in his cell as his power slipped away. Meanwhile, Hoffa's trusted aide, Frank Fitzsimmons, began his takeover of the Teamsters Union. I wish to announce that I am a candidate for the general president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and will run for that office at the International Union Convention, which begins July the 5th in Miami Beach, Florida. Eligible for parole in two years, Hoffa resigned his union office so that Fitzsimmons could run. It was a decision he would later regret. Once elected, Fitzsimmons solidified his position by making friends in the White House. He personally appealed to Richard Nixon to pardon Jimmy Hoffa. Hello, honey. How are you? I believe it. Unknown to Hoffa, Nixon added conditions to his pardon, banning him from union activity. Hoffa would say later that had he known about the restrictions, he would have refused to sign the pardon papers. In semi-retirement, Jimmy Hoffa found himself trapped in another kind of prison. To Hoffa, freedom even life itself meant a return to union power. Hoffa retained his amazing popularity. Observers thought that if Jimmy's lawyers were able to reverse the Nixon restrictions, Hoffa could win back the Teamster presidency from Fitzsimmons. But Jimmy never got the chance. July 30th, 1975. Jimmy Hoffa headed for a rendezvous with two Teamster officials, Anthony Giacalone and Tony Provenzano, a former ally with whom Hoffa had had a fist fight in prison. At 2 p.m., Hoffa arrived at the Maccus Red Fox restaurant. After waiting half an hour, he entered the restaurant and telephoned his wife to check whether Giacalone had called. Josephine Hoffa has not seen her husband since. Police searched the area for clues or a body. But industrial Detroit provides countless places to dispose of a corpse. There has been nothing, no calls or notes. As a police official, what do you think happened? There's too much to speculate on. I, I believe it's just too early, uh, perhaps the next uh, 24, 48 hours. Could someone have snatched Hoffa from the restaurant in broad daylight? Charlie Schatz was an old friend. Jim would have never walked into a trap. It's been tried before. This has been somebody that's been very close to Jim that he trusted. Hoffa's foster son, Chucky O'Brien, was questioned. Police found blood in the car O'Brien was driving, but tests proved it was that of a fish. Hoffa's family waited in vain, hoping desperately to hear from his kidnappers, 
No ransom message ever arrived. But what about the men Hoffa was supposed to meet? Tony Provenzano and Anthony Giacalone had airtight alibis for the time of Hoffa's disappearance. Both denied arranging any meeting with Jimmy. Ironically, in 1978, Provenzano went to prison for the murder of another Teamster official. Four of Provenzano's associates were also summoned to a grand jury hearing. Sal and Gabriel Brigulio, and Thomas and Stephen Andretta. Each refused to talk. In 1978, Sal was murdered gangland style on a New York street. The government still has no case for the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, but the testimony of a mafia hitman turned government informant is considered by the FBI to be a plausible description of the kidnapping drama. Investigative reporter Dan Mulday has been researching the Hoffa case for five years. In the first act, Hoffa drives from his home, arrives at the restaurant expecting to meet two underworld figures. He's picked up by one, perhaps two close associates, driven to a private residence four minutes away from the restaurant, where he is ambushed and killed. His body is then stuffed into a 55-gallon drum and taken to a location where it is placed in a compactor for junk cars. It is crushed and it is smelted. Uh, Hoffa's body will never be found. If Hoffa's disappearance was a mafia hit, what was the motive? FBI investigators believe Hoffa was killed to protect lucrative mob deals. Joe Irwin knew Hoffa for three decades. Well, they had to get Jimmy Hoffa out of the way because probably within a month he would have been uh, free of his parole deal and he would have went back into the union and he would have uh, taken over without a doubt from Fitzsimmons and crew and he would have eliminated every damn one of them. The motive for Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance goes beyond his mere ambition to regain uh, the general presidency of the Teamsters Union, which he was institutionally closed out from anyway. Uh, Hoffa was becoming increasingly unpredictable and was becoming dangerous uh, for the mob to allow to continue operating. Dan Molday believes an angry Hoffa had begun to squeal about connections between the Mafia and the CIA in Cuba. Cuba had long been a stronghold of organized crime and gambling. When the Cuban Revolution broke out, the mob sold arms to both sides. After Castro came to power, he began throwing gangsters out of Cuba. There is strong evidence that mobsters and the CIA were plotting to kill Castro and that Jimmy Hoffa was the original liaison between them. The evidence is also clear that in 1975, during the Church and Committee's investigation of the Castro assassination plots, that Hoffa was indeed giving information to the Church Committee about his knowledge and perhaps even his participation in these plots. Uh, Sam Giancana, who was planning to speak before the Church Committee, was murdered exactly one month before Hoffa disappeared. And I believe these two murders are connected. Only weeks before his disappearance, Hoffa had completed a book in which he made bitter charges against Frank Fitzsimmons. He implicated mobsters by name and specifically mentioned the end of his friendship with Tony Provenzano. This book may have been Hoffa's death warrant. Conceivably, he knew enough secrets to send dozens of mobsters to jail or the electric chair. Did Hoffa know the secret behind the crime of the century? On November 23, 1963, John Kennedy was shot to death in Dallas. The alleged killer was Lee Harvey Oswald, whose Cuban connections were documented by the Warren Commission. Oswald's murderer, Jack Ruby, had well-known ties to mobsters. According to Dan Day, FBI records indicated that Ruby phoned Hoffa aides repeatedly during November 1963. 
might tend to incriminate them. Your complete indifference to it, I think, makes this... Hoffa hated the Kennedys for mercilessly hounding him during the McClellan hearings. But did he know more than the rest of us about the president's murder? Dan Mulday. In September of 1962, Santos Traficani in Florida Underworld figure was speaking with a FBI informant. Uh, during the conversation, which included the Hoffa's personal approval of a $1.5 million Teamster pension fund loan for Traficani's associates, Traficani went into a rage over Kennedy's pursuit of Hoffa and indicated to the FBI informant that uh, Kennedy was going to be hit. Uh, during my investigation, the uh, FBI informant indicated that Traficani also added that Traficani had, quote, made it clear that it was Hoffa who was making the arrangements for the president's assassination. Jimmy Hoffa's connection with Kennedy's murder is tenuous. More certain is that Jimmy was involved with organized crime. Was he murdered by mob enemies, as the government believes? Could he have fled to avoid assassination? Or is he still being held incommunicado? For society, the moral is clear. When underworld power is linked to mighty institutions and charismatic leaders, no one is safe. Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance was the final twist in a long and turbulent career. Gifted with unique talent and charisma, Hoffa could have been one of our country's great leaders. He began on the loading docks and earned his status as a working class hero. But like so many leaders, Hoffa was corrupted by his tremendous power. He was unable to see the folly of his alliance with the underworld until it was too late.